Now that Alex Summers has been named the new leader of X Factor, will he be able to turn this group of lovable losers around? Or will it end up costing him his own relationship with Polaris? Well, let's hop to the pages of X Factor issue number two and find out together, shall we? Alrighty then, so as we join the book, Havoc is waking up about to start his first brand new day working for the government. They need him to start right away as the brand new leader of X Factor, considering their old leader Angel Warren Worthington is still in the hospital and every other member on the team was horribly killed on their first mission. A fact of which has not actually hurt the team's popularity, in fact, quite the opposite. Now, Alex's girlfriend, Polaris, doesn't exactly love the idea of Alex being a government stooge. Havoc basically says that if it wasn't him, they would pick someone else, and at least this way he can try and make positive changes for mutant kind on the inside, right? But he can tell that isn't really good enough for Magneto's daughter, and because of that, Havoc agrees to accompany Polaris to a special meeting of the mutant underground. A group dedicated to helping mutant kind post Krakoa, of which Lorna has actually managed to find a great deal of solace in. Now, actually trying to enact positive change within X-Factor proves to be quite the uphill battle. Broderick has his own strong ideas about how this play should be run, mainly as one giant reality show feeding the TikTok oh sorry, click clock algorithms. Havoc also doesn't love the idea that it looks like Pyro of all people is going to be his number two. Too. Why? Because fire is very useful and he tested very well in our focus groups. Then, of course, there's Havoc's other boss, General Mills. Don't forget, X Factor is actually a subsidiary of the American military. As a good leader, Havoc wants to try and figure out why exactly that last mission against X Turn was such a nightmare and why so many poor souls got themselves killed. Mills has a pretty strong working theory, and that is that the agents of X Turn were actually tipped off about X Factor's raid. And wouldn't you know, it, but suspect number one turns out to be none other than the Mutant Underground. In fact, Polaris herself is actually seen on camera attending one of their meetings. Meaning that despite all of Mills and Broderick's big talk about Havoc being perfect to lead X-Factor because he's a hero, someone for the other members to look up to, in reality, they probably just picked him because he's dating Polaris. Now, how exactly do the other members of X-Factor feel about their current situation? Well, they're a little split. Some are enjoying the splendor that the American military military is affording them right now, mansions, pools, fame, etc, etc. While people like Cyber, and that's Cyber with an X, FYI, worry that he and the others were only chosen because they're so expendable. Then you got people like Cecily Reyes, who say that she joined the team to be a medic to try and stop other mutants from dying, but also she needed the money and just got out of a bad relationship. My favorite motivation, and I knew this before I even picked up the book, is Granny Smite, the brand new character, as we learn her mutant ability is actually immortality. She's been around for a very long time. Her mind has clearly deteriorated over this long period, and she hopes that X Factor may finally offer her the opportunity to die. You know, at least in a fresh, new, and interesting way. Ah, round of applause. This is vintage Mark Russell right here. Granny Smite, the breakout character of the year, says Cape Joel, and you can put that on the dust jacket for the trade, I promise. Now, later that night, Alex actually does make good on his word, joining Lorna at at the Mutant Underground meeting, and despite the initial description of them helping wayward hard-up mutants, they just so happen to be having this big secret meeting in an L.A. mansion, meaning that they can't possibly be as hard-up as the homeless mutants we've seen over in the pages of NYX. Now, the Mutant Underground's leader is a dog-faced gentleman by the name of Bruin, who regales to Havoc a very sad story of his origin, how he was put up for adoption by his parents when his mutation activated, how he was taken in by a cruel uncle who used him in a circus freak show. It was on that day Bruin learned the hard truth about mutant-human interaction, and that is that they will only ever be accepting, only ever be tolerant of mutants when humans think that they're getting something out of the arrangement, either either labor, protection, or novelty, and that mutant kind needs to accept humankind as it is and meet them on their own terms, not waiting for them to change, but simply dealing with them as they are. And again, if this feels very very specific to what Havoc is dealing with right now as a new agent of the government, it should. Alex might not be the brightest bulb on the Christmas tree, but even he can go, wait a minute, is this play about me? Is this some sort of weirdo intervention you've dragged me to, Polaris? And indeed it is, but 
Todd Havoc does jump the gun. He assumes the mutant underground probably want him to spy on the American military for them, when in reality, all they want him to do is quit. And who knows, if the underground had more time, or if things had gone differently, maybe Havoc would have listened to them, but that all ends up flying out the window once Bruin realizes that Alex is wearing one of Broderick's live-streaming cameras, so naturally the underground is pissed that they end up having a spy in their midst. The underground goons advance on him while Alex powers up to try and defend himself. Poor Polaris ends up getting hit during the exchange, and the whole thing pretty much ends up escalating and devolving from there. The other members of X Factor end up kicking down the front door, and Alex is forced to make a retreat. In her internal monologue, Polaris talks about a time when she had mentioned the famous Mariner's Tale to Havoc, you know, the one about the sailors adrift at sea who kill an albatross because they think it's an omen, but in reality, the bird was the only thing that could ever lead them back to land. Alex, of course, thought this was a Beastie Boy song. All of this comes to a major head in the finale when Polaris actively chooses to not go with the escaping Havoc and his team. And so that was X Factor issue number two, everybody, and while I ultimately did enjoy this issue, I would be lying if I said it wasn't nearly as fun or as funny as the issue that preceded it. In fact, in a surprise twist, this one ends up veering directly into full-on drama. Which, you know, is certainly fine. Mark Russell is capable of doing both so both it seems like he's going to do. This series really has zeroed in on Alex Summers as the most lovable loser in all of Mutantum, a guy who no matter what he does can never seem to get it right. Which is, for all intents and purposes, a carryover from his Krakoa characterization, wherein he moved Heaven and Earth to get back together with the Goblin Queen, only for that to not be everything he wanted it to be. Now Havoc is both a leader to a team full of lovable losers like himself, and all it took to get there was to, well, sell a little piece of his soul to the government store. And that too has also become a choice that has cost him the love in his life. Maybe he's right though, and maybe he is the only one who can actually turn X-Force into a force for good on the inside, or maybe Polaris is right and he's just deluding himself. Either way, this book is playing with some very interesting ideas when it comes to social acceptance. Identity and dysphoria, and I'm certainly hoping to see them further grow these themes and ideas as the series goes on. Again, I don't think X-Factor is a book that's going to please everyone, but it's so weird and darkly funny and specific if you are the kind of person who would enjoy this, and I definitely think I am, you're gonna enjoy it a lot. Even if, like a lot of Mark Russell work, this book might as well come with a little stamp on it that says future cult classic. Overall, though, I think I'd feel comfortable giving this specific issue a 7.5 out of 10. Hey there everyone, it's your old pal Cape Jewel again, thanking you so much for watching to the end of the video. I hope you enjoyed it, and if you did, why not check out my Amazon link down in the description. Yes, that's right, the Cape Jewel channel officially has its own Amazon storefront now. You can pick up a comic or anything else for that matter, and if you did, you'd really be helping me in the channel. So with that out of the way everyone, I will see you again next time. Bye bye